Well, the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of God working in our hearts and our lives. To all of our guests and friends who are sharing this day, we are so delighted that you have come. You are not here by accident today. God has brought you here to touch your life, to minister to you in a special way. Praise God. And uh, we look forward to being filled with God's Spirit. You may not know this name as Ben Gillette. He was a famous magician. He is a famous magician and outspoken atheist. Some years ago, he made a YouTube video about a businessman who gave him a Bible. You might expect Gillette to castigate the man for what he called proselytizing. But actually, Gillette, the opposite is true. Here's what he said. He was really kind and nice and sane. And he looked me in the eyes and he talked to me and then he gave me this Bible. And I've always said that I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. Gillette explained, if you believe that there's a heaven and a hell, and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that it's not really worth telling them because it would make it socially awkward, how much do you have to hate someone to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that. Now this is an atheist talking. It's not Pastor Harper talking this morning. This is an atheist saying, how much do you have to hate someone if you believe this message, you believe this gospel, you believe that Jesus is the only way, he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the door. If you believe that Jesus is the only Savior of the world, and that eternally people will be lost or saved, he said, how much do you have to hate someone to believe that and not tell them? And then he added, that was a really good man who gave me this book. I wonder this morning, what will you say to the Jean Penn Gillettes that you meet this week? What will you say to them? You know, President Trump has a theme, make America great again. I want the church to be great again. And uh, it, it's uh, so important for us. You know, in this series, Be Filled with the Spirit, we have examined three elements. The first one was found in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verse 18, where it says, Be filled with the Spirit. You know, the Scripture says, You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me. You're going to be witness to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Judea and the innermost parts of the world. So the baptism of the Holy Ghost or the Spirit of God is found in the book of Acts. The beginning of the church. God began His church with a fullness of His Spirit upon those 120 disciples in that upper room. We talk about the initial evidence of being baptized with the Holy Ghost. And that is speaking with other tongues or unknown tongues. As the Spirit of God gives the utterance, that's a tongue that you never learned in school. It's a language you never were taught. It's your spirit being energized by the Holy Spirit, speaking directly to God. And the Bible lets us know that you edify your soul when you do that. Jude says you build up your most holy faith praying in the Holy Ghost. And then, of course, there are additional uh, additional. Uh, gifts that God gives to those that are, are spirit-filled. One of those is tongues and interpretation in the service. But what I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about the initial evidence of receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now today I want to share with you what it means or what are the evidences of a spirit-filled life. I know that some people think it's more than just speaking with other tongues or using your prayer language. There are other evidences of the Spirit-filled life. Obviously, every believer ought to have an active prayer life. Amen? Amen? 
that includes two elements. Number one, you pray and sing with your understanding in your native tongue, your native language. The second element is that you pray and sing with your spirit. And Paul says, forbid not to speak with tongues. And again, that is only the initial evidence. But I want you to know it's more than just, you know, we used the term in Pentecost years and years ago about praying through. Well, what did we mean by that, pray through? Well, you break through whatever obstacles or barriers you had until you were lost in the Holy Ghost and you were praying in the Spirit. And yet Paul says, I will. It's a matter of the will. You don't need a lightning bolt coming out of heaven to pray in the Holy Ghost. You don't need goosebumps running up and down your back and goosebumps on your goosebumps to feel like you want to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance and in your prayer language to Him. You don't need all, of, you, you don't have to have all of that. Paul says, I will sing and pray with my understanding, and I will, everyone say, I will. I will, I will pray and sing in the Spirit. There's not a person here, if you've been baptized with the Holy Ghost, that could not right now, this very moment, speak in other tongues. And yet the Bible says in the church, there needs to be order. There needs to be. I think that was the problem with the Corinthian church. Everybody was talking in tongues at one time. and It was, uh, it was disorderly. It wasn't, he wasn't critical of tongues. He was critical of the disorder. That it wasn't done in an orderly fashion. And that people where he said people off the street going to come in and hear all that and think you're crazy. And uh, that is true. So there has to be order in the service. But when you're talking to God in your own prayer closet, when you're speaking to the Lord, maybe as a group here at the altars here, and you're praying in your heavenly language that God has given you, that's a direct connection between you and the Lord. And I wish more people were more fluent and, uh, and uh, easy in moving into praying in the Holy Ghost. But there are other evidences. There's another side of the experience of being filled with the Holy Ghost. Do you know there's no one term used more by the Apostle Paul and the other disciples concerning our duty, our obligation, our responsibilities, and our privileges of the Christian life. And that one word that the apostle uses again and again and again of what it means to be filled with the Spirit is the word walk. Everyone say walk. walk. You see, our walk with God is our daily relationship with our Creator. And our Savior. Being filled with the Spirit is not just a one-time experience, but it is a daily relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, the baptism in the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit or being filled with the Spirit is not a one-time experience, but it is a lifestyle of the believer. Reinhard Bonnick, in his book, Mighty Manifestation, says this. The baptism in the Holy Spirit was not meant to be a single emotional event recorded in a believer's diary. It wraps believers around permanently. The Spirit is their environment, the air which they breathe moment by moment, providing the vitality of the Christian faith. What's he saying here? He's saying that the baptism of the Spirit is not a one-time event, but it's something, it is the air we breathe, it is our our relationship with Jesus Christ. Being filled with the Spirit is being filled with God. and is being connected to God every moment of every day. That's what the Lord desires out of your life and mine. See, so it goes on to say that the, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is not an event. It is a lifestyle. We continually draw strength and life from the Holy Spirit. Apart from the Holy Spirit, we have no strength or spiritual vitality. Can you say amen? amen. And just like uh, rechargeable batteries, we are renewed and refreshed every day when we are energized by the Holy Ghost. You see, batteries are a great portable power source. Batteries come in all shapes and sizes, and they're used to power just about anything that you can imagine. Perhaps the best of all batteries is the rechargeable kind. 
I like those rechargeable kind. I have rechargeable batteries on my cell phone. Just plug it in, it recharges. I have a, re I have a rechargeable battery in my computer. Now, how many of you, you have a phone, how long do you think it worked if you never took the time to recharge it? Hello? Some people would be in a panic. But what if I never put it on the charger? What if I never plugged in my laptop to let the battery recharge? You guessed it, it wouldn't work very long, would it? The battery must be recharged in order to be effective, in order for things to run. Now, just as likewise, each of us here today need to have our spiritual batteries recharged. Otherwise, we're not going to be effective and we won't last long. How is it that someone, and I, it's mind-boggling to me, and I don't understand it, and I've been in the ministry now, and in the next, next couple of years, it'll be close to 50 years. Next year, it'll be 50 years I've been preaching the gospel. And I still don't understand it, how people who have experienced this wonderful filling of God's Spirit, of whom the angels desire to look into and cannot. They would love to experience what I experienced as a 10-year-old boy. He would, they would love to experience what you have experienced. That's Christ in you, the hope of glory. I don't know how you would want to let that go. How you'd want that, let that just kind of go away from your life. I don't know what's in your thinking, but I need thee every hour I need thee. I need the Spirit of God. I want the Spirit of God. How many remember the night that the Lord filled you with, or the day God filled you with the Holy Ghost? How full you felt. How wonderful you felt. How excited and energized. How clean you felt. Well, who would ever want to lose that? So it, does, it doesn't compute with me how people can experience this and turn around and walk away from it. Never to feel that touch again unless they return. See, that's a life. You talk about a miserable life. That has to be a miserable life. When you have tasted, he says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And when you have tasted of this precious heavenly gift, why would you ever want to let, let go of it? Why would you not want to have your batteries, your spiritual batteries, recharged so that your life can be an effective? It's not, just a, it's not enough just to get plugged into God one time. See, the daily routine of life has a way of draining us of our spiritual vitality. The things that you and I face, not only physically, emotionally, but spiritually as well. God desires that you and me become fully charged. And that's what the Apostle Paul meant when he said in Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit. In other words, be recharged with the Holy Ghost every time. You know, Galatians, Paul says in Galatians, the fifth chapter, go on and go pick out, but in verses 16 through 25, in verse 16 he says, I say, this I say then, walk in the Spirit and you will not obey the lust of the flesh. In verse 25, he says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Verse 18 adds that we are led of the Spirit. Can you hear that theme? I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles to Romans, the 8th chapter. I'm going to go down a list of verses here because I want you to get the full impact of what it means to be filled with the Spirit and how God views our daily walk with Him. Now, I remember the night, I remember that evening that God filled me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost in Los Angeles, California as a 10-year-old boy. I will never forget that day. But God says, here it is, you know, 57 years later, 56 years later, and I still have that baptism of the Holy Ghost in my life. It's there in the present. But here's what he says. He describes this whole concept of those who live according to the Spirit. First of all, he says, there's no condemnation to those, 
to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but what? But who walk after the Spirit. There's no condemnation. Verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. How many appreciate that? We're no longer under the bondage of sin and death. We know that when we lay these bodies down, when we fold up the tent and set it aside, that we're going to one day have a new body, a glorified body. Verse 4. He says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, again, who walk not after the flesh, but who walk after the Spirit. That thing, walk. Verse 5. For they that walk are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they who walk that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. I think King James uses the word mind, but he, he's talking walk here. He's talking about a relationship. Or verse 6. For to be carnally minded or fleshly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. It's a powerful statement, isn't it? So if you don't have the Spirit of God in your life, you don't belong to it. It's like what, what, what the writer of Hebrews says, if you don't receive correction, you're not a son. Because he says a son will receive correction. So if you don't receive a correction, you're judging yourself not a child of God. And how many know we all need correction of the Lord? He says if you receive it, then you're a son. If you don't receive it, you're illegitimate. You're walking in no disobedience. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Verse 11 is an often misinterpreted scripture. I want to read it to you. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your what? Mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Can you see that this passage does not deal with the rapture of the church? It's not, not dealing with the rapture of the church. It has nothing to do with that. He says, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, if it dwell in you, shall quicken these mortal bodies. Not immortal mortal bodies, but shall quicken this mortal body by His Spirit that what? Dwells in you. Verse 13, for if we live after the flesh, you'll die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify or put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. You see the condition? If you through the Holy Spirit do put to death the deeds of the flesh, then you're going to live. Verse 14, Paul speaks concerning what it means to be a disciple of Christ. And he puts it very simply and profoundly. For as many of you as are led by the Spirit of God, you are the sons of God. You notice the condition? If we're led by the Spirit, then we are the sons of God. And then he culminates this passage in the next few verses. In verse 26, he says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities or our weaknesses or our inability to produce results. Because he goes on to say, we don't know how we ought to pray. We get down there and we talk, we give our shopping cart list of God things that we want from God. And he says we're not praying like we should, but the Spirit of God in us makes intercession for us. And he says how? With groanings that cannot be uttered. And then he culminates this whole thing in verse 27 by saying, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You know, when you and I are praying in the Spirit... When we're praying in the Holy Ghost, when there's groanings which cannot be put into words. The Bible says the Spirit is making intercession for us. 
How many know we don't always intercede like we should? We're not always capable, but to see the Spirit of God in us is capable of interceding in situations and circumstances with groanings that cannot be ordered, uh, 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 uttered. And folks, if God be for us, what? Then who can be against us? I want you to know God is for you. I want you to know God is for your family. God is for your, your teens. God is for your children. God is for your life. God is for your family. So this great theme of Paul's letters is the theme of walk in the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. And then walk in the Spirit. Romans 6, 4 says, walk in the newness of life. Ephesians 2, 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath ordained before ordained that we should what? Walk in them. Ephesians 4, 1, I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you were called. Ephesians 5 and 2, and walk in love. As Christ loved us. Ephesians 5 8. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Ephesians 5 15. See then that you walk circumspectly or with wisdom, not as fools. Colossians 1 10. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. Have you noticed that being filled with the Spirit will produce good works? You notice that? Being filled with, filled with the Spirit does, does not mean you sit on a bench and warm it. It doesn't mean being filled with the Spirit that you are a spectator. No, it means that you are a participator. You're not just, you're not just sitting there <coughs> observing and being entertained. But being filled with the Spirit means I'm going to put my hand to the plow. I'm not going to look back. And I'm going to serve the Lord in every capacity and every way that I can. Let's put our hands into the Lord. He says that you walk worthy of the Lord, being fruitful in every good work. Producing good works helps us to understand the worthiness of the Lord. Colossians 2 and 6 it says, As if you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. How about Colossians 4 and 6? It talks about walk in wisdom. 1 Thessalonians 2 and 14 says that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you. Again, there's this walk. It's a step by step. It's not a sprint. It is a walk. Praise God. It is a step by step. I know there's some people who get afraid and they say, well, what if I can't live this? Well, you know, I can't live it. I said, well, what do you mean you can't live it? No, you can't live it. It takes the Spirit of God in us to help us to take one step at a time, being led in the Spirit, being walking in the Spirit, and being filled with the Spirit one step at a time. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 says, How you ought to walk and not please, how to walk and to please God. See, walking with God, pleasing Him. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 12 says that you may walk honestly toward them that are without and that you may have lack of nothing. Walking honestly before the Lord. 1 John 1 and 7 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You notice that you walk in the light and as you walk in the light, you have fellowship with one another and His blood as we walk in the light, as we are obedient to the Lord and obedient to the Spirit, then His blood cleanses us. It reminds me of the ten lepers in the New Testament that Jesus that came to Jesus and cried afar off saying, Lord, you know, help us. And the Lord told them, I want you to go and show yourself to the priest. Now here they are filled with leprosy. All of that's still there. What do you mean go and show yourself? See, you could only go show yourself to the priest if you were healed of that leprosy, if you are cured. Now, he's telling them, with all kinds of leprosy, I want you to go. And the Bible says, I love this. I love this. The Bible says, as they went, they were healed. Every step. 
taken toward the priest to show themselves to the priest, there was a gradual healing in their bodies. Hallelujah. As they went, sometimes we want the miracle, but God says, no, you follow my command, you do what I say, and you will be healed. So he says, and this is what John is saying, if we walk in the light, then we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ on a continual basis. And he cleanses us from what? All sin. 1 John 2 and 6, 6 says, He that saith he abideth in him ought also to walk, even as Jesus walked. Do you see this thing? Always walking, taking one step at a time. You have the initial experience of the receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost or the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And from that point on, we have to walk in the Spirit. Amen. Oh, look, I've been in this long enough to know. I've seen people come in, receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, be filled with them at these altars, walk out and never, never come back to church. He said, well, they didn't get a good experience. I said, well, I don't think you can get a bad experience of God. I don't know what it's a bad, can you have a bad experience in the Holy Ghost? No. Well, what was the problem? Why didn't they continue? Because they didn't walk in the Spirit. It's, it's no more complicated than that. Oh, I know there are folks who want to blame the church, the pastor, the superintendent, the teachers, and other people in the church for their failure to walk in the Holy Ghost. But I will tell you, regardless of your background, regardless of where you were born and how you were raised, regardless of your education or the house you live in, the car you drive, or the clothes you wear, regardless of your work and your vocation, it doesn't matter. There's not a person in my audience today that cannot be walking in the Holy Ghost, walking in the Spirit. It's not predicated on any of those things. It's predicated on a heart that says, Lord, I want to receive you and I want to walk in you. I want to go forward in you. I think of Enoch in Genesis, the fifth chapter. The Bible says that Enoch walked with God and was translated. He didn't see death because he walked with God. The scripture says after Methuselah was born, he was 65 years old, he walked with God for 300 years. I don't think any of us are going to live that long, are we? Not today. And I'm sure he saw a lot of things in his lifetime because they were moving toward they were moving toward the destruction of the world through the flood. The Bible says that violence filled the land. But he walked with God in the midst of that perverse generation for 300 years. Can you not walk with him for 10, 20, 30, however much long, longer time we have? The Bible says in Genesis 6, 9, speaks of Noah who walked with God and was saved, he and his household. Well, there's a need to be refilled with the Spirit, isn't it? Amen. Remember the batteries, our spiritual batteries need to be recharged. Paul writing to Titus said the same thing about our spiritual life. Titus 2, 14, we are saved by the washing of the regeneration. <clears throat> They're saved by the washing of regeneration and, everyone say, and, and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Building up your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So we're, we're washed, washing to regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Paul says, I will pray in the Spirit in my understanding. Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2 says, You present your bodies, what? A living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God. Which is your what? Reasonable service. One to, uh, other translation says, this is your reasonable worship. It's your reasonable worship. You see, our daily life should be a worship to God. It should be Christ-honoring. And it cannot be Christ-honoring without a fullness of the Holy Ghost. Oh, I need thee, Lord. I need thee every hour I need thee. And he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Well, how do we get our minds renewed if it's not through the Holy Spirit? Getting our batteries recharged. Getting our mind renewed. Getting our spirit energized by the renewing of our minds. He says, then 
And only then will you know the will of God for your life. Let me close with the seven evidences of the Spirit-filled life. It's found in Ephesians. It begins in chapter 14. And he says this, seven evidences. Let me give you this. The evidence of walking in unity. There's the evidence of walking in purity. There's the evidence of walking in love. There's the evidence of walking in the light or truth. There's the evidence of walking in ordered and careful life. The evidence of walking in harmony and submission. And then finally in chapter 6, he talks about walking in victory. Verses, verses 1 through 16, I'm not going to take the time to read all of this, but just know here's the theme of that passage. He says, first of all, walk worthy. And then he, he talks about how we ought to walk in unity. Everyone say unity. He goes on to say, you keep the unity of the Spirit until you come into the unity of the faith. And there's unity. Because why? There's only one body. Folks, we're in this together, aren't we? Yeah. And we need to love one another. We need to like one another. We need to work with one another. And the only way we can do that is to be filled with the Holy Ghost so that we can do that. How many know that sometimes a brother or sister can just rub you the wrong way? And you can get irritated. I mean, there's a few times, and you know, you know me. Sometimes, for for people's sake, I'd love to slap them around, throw them up against the wall, knock some sense into them. I've never done that. But you just—it's like like Papa Glass one day. He was talking to a man who didn't want to, you know, want to come to church and be saved. And he was sitting in his in his living room. He had walk, talked with him, had worked with him for for years, and finally. Papa Glass just said, you know, if I had a gun and I could do that, I'd march you down to the church. I'd force you to go to that church. I'd march, march you down that altar. And I'd, I, would, I would force you to kneel. And I would force you to give your life to the Lord. That's how much I love you. That's how much I care. But you know, you can't do that. Because the Lord's a perfect gentleman. If you don't want the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you'll never receive it. If you don't think it's for you, it won't be for you. But if you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, then you're in the right place at the right time this very moment to receive a fullness of the Holy Spirit in your life. You're in the right place. He says one of the evidences is that there'll be, there'll be a, a working together, a unity. There'll be a, walk, a walking in unity. And, and uh, Paul is pleading with the church to live up to that blessing of walking in unity. Where do we go from here? What do we think about? He says, think about all the things that God has done, the gifts that he has given you. He said, you should never allow the unity of the church to be threatened. I know I've lived long enough to see church splits and people, groups of people leave, but I will tell you, it's never of God. And I will tell you that I've watched folks who for crazy, odd reasons try to disrupt the church, bring disunity to the church. But God wants unity. God wants unity. And I understand that there are certain circumstances and situations where because of failure in the church and in the leaders of the church that won't repent, that people need to make changes. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about penny ante stuff that people get upset for. Somebody didn't shake my hand. Somebody doesn't like me. Well, join the human race. I've been at this a long time. I'm, I think I'm a pretty nice guy. I don't know why anybody doesn't like me. But you'd be surprised how many people say, well, you, you offended me. I had someone just the other day. <laughs> Who got offended because they texted me and I didn't see it. And I didn't text them back soon enough. So they were mad at me. And well, I didn't see it. You know, I do have a couple other things to do and I don't always check my phone. But I did respond. You know, people can use some such silly things to find offense. 
and endeavor to leave the church or break unity with the church. Folks, our unity needs to be protected. Can you say amen? amen. Because it's our believer's relationship to the church. He says in verses 17 through 32, he says, now walk in purity. This has to do with our relationship to the world. You know, the, the evidence of a spiritual life is that, number one, we are in Christ, and we're going to walk a life that's pure and holy and godly in Christ. I know that terms like godliness and holiness sometimes to some folks are, are, are negative terms, but they're not negative. The Bible says we ought to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. You see, holiness is beautiful because it's righteousness, it's godliness, it's being like God. How can that be ugly? So he says, walk in Christ, walk in purity. You know, we can't, we can't insulate ourselves from the world. We are in the world, but we're not of it. We are witness to the world. But he says, you have to walk in purity. You need to walk a lifestyle that honors and pleases God. Now, folks, here's how this, is, this works out. You get up in the morning and you say, what kind of life should I live today that would honor you? What would I do to please you? How should I dress? How should I talk? How should I walk? What should be my attitude today? Hello? What should be my mindset and my attitude today? As I go about my business and my life that honors you, I want to walk in purity. Hello? That means there's some jokes that may be told at work you don't laugh at. Okay. Paul says, put off some things. He says, put on some things. And then he says, put away some things. Romans 6 teaches us that the old self has to be crucified. Paul said, I die, how often? Daily. I die daily, that I might live in the Holy Ghost. Folks, we need to die daily, otherwise we cannot, I hear, hear me now, we cannot live the life of purity and holiness and godliness in Christ. We'll start compromising where we should not compromise. But he says that old life needs to be crucified, it needs to be buried. And we need to rise to walk in the newness of life. He goes on to say we must put on Christ. How often? Daily. Number three, he says walk in love. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. What kind of love is he talking about? He's talking about an agape love. An agape love is a sacrificial love. It's a godlike love. It's not you pat my back, I pat yours. It is a sacrificial, sacrificial love. He says to the disciples, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Folks, we need to do all things in love. Sometimes we need to have a tough love. Sometimes we need to speak directly. and Sometimes we need to speak pointedly. But never unkindly. Never with, never with hate. Never with anger. He says, preach the truth. But you preach the truth, what? In love. You plead. That's how God deals with you and me. He pleads with us. He pleads with you and me to walk close to Him and to walk in the love. And He says, if you walk in love, you're going to hate certain things. You're going to hate what sin does to people. You're going to hate the devil and all that he does. And we must walk in love. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. How? How? By the Holy Ghost. Number four, we need to walk in the light. This has to do with fellowship and partnership. It has to do with uh, it has to do with uh, with uh, living according to the truth of, of God's ways in our fellowship with one another. Christians are to partake of His divine nature and His grace. You see, the light has no fellowship with darkness. We need to fellowship. If you have more friends in the world than you have in the church, something is not right. I had someone tell, ask me a while back, says, uh, I don't have many friends in the church. I said, well, how many do you have? I've got two or three or four. I said, well, then you're a lucky man. But I said, here's the key. If you would have friends, you must show yourself friendly. Hello. And so that's what it means to walk in fellowship and partnership. You walk in the light. 
and you have fellowship with all those in the light. He says, light has no fellowship with darkness, and we should live the truth, and we should love the truth. Does doctrine matter? I've got, you know, I've watched over the years. It's one thing if you've never known this truth. It's one thing if you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's one thing if you don't understand all of this. It's one thing that you, you don't understand the mighty God in Christ. It's, it's one thing if you've never been exposed to worshiping the Lord who is God in spirit. It's one thing. But if you've experienced it, if you have, have received it, how in the world can you set that aside and go to lesser understanding? For me, doctrine does matter. But I have discovered by itself, doctrine does not keep me. Understanding truth does not necessarily keep people. And the reason why it doesn't is because they are not filled with the Spirit. Because if you are filled with the Holy Ghost, you're going to love truth. You're going to buy the truth and sell it not. Hello? Doctrine should matter. It must matter. The Word of God should matter to you. Somebody says, well, he only said that once. Well, God doesn't have to say, repeat himself for it to be valid. He said, let there be light, and there was light, you know. And he didn't say, he didn't repeat himself. Oh, by the way, let there be light. He didn't repeat himself. He doesn't have to repeat himself because every word, every jot, every tittle in this word is true. Heaven and earth is going to pass away, but my word shall not pass away. We should love the word of God. Number five, he says, walk orderly and serve, uh, carefully and carefully. Chapter 5, verses 15 to 7. The word he uses here is circumspectly, which means an ordered and careful life. Walk an ordered and careful life. Look around, you know, so as not to stumble. Be aware. Be knowledgeable. And he says, look for good opportunities. Opportunities to share your faith. He instructs them, don't be slothful. But be fervent in the spirit. And he says, don't waste your life. Don't waste your time. And don't waste any opportunities that may be available to you. You see, being filled with the spirit is evidenced by you looking around and doing good and all that you can. And being sensitive to the opportunities that are avail available to you. Debbie's been uh, given a little devotion Bible study there at, at her work for off and on for a couple, three months. And God's working in people's lives. You take advantage of every opportunity. Sometimes it happens in the workplace. But you look for every opportunity to love the Lord. And I want Debbie to testify about that too. Remind me. Testify next week. Okay? It's Mother's Day. Number six, and I'm coming to a close. He says, walk in harmony. I know this is more instructive today and on my message, a little different than I normally take. But I'm talking about the evidences of, of the spirit-filled life. Sometimes we think if we just feel goosebumps and we speak with other tongues, that, that means I'm, I'm A-OK. -okay. But he says, walk in harmony. You see, God is, let me just say this, God is... When God fills you with the Holy Ghost, let me, let, me, let me put it this way. Samson, the Bible says, was moved on by the Spirit of God, right? And he did exploits. He did wonderful things. But then he walked down and did some terrible things. Right? God is not quick to withdraw his presence from you, but he does want obedience. And so there's other evidences. You may in a service like this feel the presence of God and God renew you in His Spirit. But when we leave this place, we need to walk a certain way. That is evidence of the Holy Ghost in our lives, active and relevant in our lives on a daily basis. It's not just what happens in your prayer closet. It's not just what happens here in a service like this. It's what happens every day of your life at work, driving down the highway, wherever you may go. He says, walk in harmony. And he first starts talking about husbands and wives. And he talks about the secret of the fullness of the Spirit. And he says, walk from, <coughs> you got power from within. So you need to have the element of, of 
mutual harmony in the home. He notes the elements of, of this mutual harmony. He says in verse 19, there's joy. Verse 20, there's gratitude. Verse 21, there's obedience. There'll be joy, there'll be gratitude, there'll be obedience. And then he has instruction for children, talking about walking in harmony. And he says, whatever you do, you do as unto the Lord. And then finally, in chapter 6 of Ephesians, he says, walk in victory. Be strong in the Lord was his message. And in the power of whose might? His might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord. How are we strong in the Lord? By being filled with the Spirit. We've got power from God. We're strong in his might. Can I remind you what John said? Greater is he that is what? In you than he that is in the world. So he says you put on the whole armor of God. If you're filled with the Spirit, you will want to put on the whole armor of God. Now that armor is defensive in nature. It's to get, so that you can dispel all the fiery darts of the wicked. So that you may protect your life. So you put on that armor as a protection so that we, we uh, uh, can walk with God. And then we have weapons, advanced, advanced weapons that God gives us. We have the Word of God. Everyone say Amen. But then he culminates by he say, by saying, praying always with all perseverance and with all kinds of prayer and supplication in the Spirit. How? You get all those things by praying in the Spirit. And he says, watching thereunto and persevering. I'd like for us to stand here right now and believe the Lord. How much we need a fullness of the Spirit of God. I want to thank you for this patience, your patience this morning in this message. A little bit different approach than I normally take. But I want you to know that there's more evidence than just speaking with other tongues in a good service. You need to do that. I said you need to do that. You need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. You need to pray through till you break through. You need to do that at home. You need to do that, to, you know, Many times throughout the week, be filled with the Spirit. God has given you a prayer language. God wants to pray. I will pray and sing in the Holy Ghost. I will do that. I will pray and sing with my understanding. We need to do that. But God gives you and me the power to go out and live a life that's evidenced that God lives in me. And he says that evidence is a walk. A step by step of what God intends us to be. A reflection of His glory. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus that we should walk in Him. Hallelujah. Close your eyes for a moment. The Holy Ghost is here in such a powerful way. I know this message has been instructive in nature. But I feel that everyone here wants to be filled with the Spirit. That each and every one of us here this morning want a fullness of the Holy Ghost in our lives. Praise God. Take somebody by the hand right where you stand. Hallelujah. Let's pray, church. Let's just seek God for a moment here. Ask the Lord just to fill you with His Spirit.